I remember sitting in the pew on every Sunday, hearing a lesson and saying something like this in my mind. I felt like that preacher was preaching right to me today. Have you ever said that yourself, maybe, when J.R. was preaching or maybe at our gospel meeting? Or have you ever gotten your car and drove off on a Sunday afternoon and thought, well, I wonder who the preacher was preaching to today? Could I give you a secret? We're preaching to ourselves. That's what we do. Sermon ideas come from studying the Bible and then examining our own lives and seeing where it doesn't match up. That's where a lot, not every sermon, but that's where a lot of sermon ideas come. And so today I want to focus on the nature of our relationship with God through His Word. You know, in, in pagan religions, it was all about making the sacrifices the right way. It was all about performing these rituals in the right way. If you killed someone, yeah, your god might get upset. He might do something drastic. But generally, what the pagan gods wanted and what paganism taught is that the gods really didn't care if you were a liar or a cheater or a thief or a murderer or whatever. What the gods of the ancient world wanted was for the worshiper to offer the right sacrifice in the right way. And so these rituals would be precise. And if you mess something up, you'd have to go back to the beginning and you'd have to do it all over again. That's what paganism taught the gods wanted. And that is in stark contrast to the God of the Bible. The God of the Romans and the gods of the Greeks, they didn't care so much about the morality or the sincerity or the heart of the worshiper. What they wanted was the right sacrifice. At least that's what they were being told. But the God of the Bible wants more than that. There's a great difference there. God cares about the people who offer the sacrifice. What's more important to God is what's going on inside. What's more important to God is the heart of the one who's making the sacrifice. And that's just as true as it is today as when David offered bulls and goats on the altar. And so when we begin to think, well, I've gone through the motions. I've worshipped God in, in the way that He has told me to in the New Testament. And we feel like just by virtue of doing that, we've pleased God. We're not getting the whole picture. God cares about the heart. It's not to say our actions don't mean anything. But God cares about what's going on in your heart right now when you're sitting in the pew, right now in this church building. God cares about what's going on in your heart. Let's talk about the heart in the Bible. We can read a couple of passages, and I think we can get a, a, at least a, a pretty well-rounded idea of when the Bible talks about the heart. We can understand what it's talking about. Genesis 6, 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil Continually, There's a lot to be said about that verse, but it is the part of me and the part of you that has intentions. It's the part of you that thinks. It is your mind. It is your intellect. Genesis chapter 20 and verse 6, you remember the king Abimelech was talking, uh, there, there's an altercation there between uh, Abraham and Abimelech, and now God is speaking to Abimelech. And God says this, Yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this. And I also kept you from sinning against me, therefore I did not let you touch her, Abraham's wife. And so it is the part of me that has integrity. The part of me that contains morality. It is the character. Ephesians 4 and verse 18. Paul speaking about the Gentiles who were darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God. Why? Because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And so I learned from that that the heart is the part of me that can either be submissive or can be stubborn, cooperative or rebellious. It is the will of man. 
David says in Psalm 4, 7, You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and new wine abound. I know that the, the, the heart of man, my heart, is where I feel things. It's my emotions. And so when I look at the heart in the Bible, I'm talking about the inward man, the inner self. It is the, what makes us who we are. It what makes you different than everyone else. It is what makes you up intellectually or morally or emotionally. The heart is your, your spiritual personality. It's the seat of our affections. It is the fount of our emotions. It's what makes you who you are. And who can talk about the heart without quoting Proverbs 4 and verse 23? When the wise man said, watch over your heart or keep your heart with all diligence. Why is that so important? Because from it, from the heart, flow the springs of life. And so my life and my behavior and what I do with my body and all of that is a product of what's going on inside in this spiritual man. This is the part, ladies and gentlemen, that God can see with clarity. You can truss it up all you want with your Instagram account. You can make yourself look however you want with your Facebook. You can lie to everybody on the face of the earth, but you're not going to fool God. You're not going to pull the wool over God's eyes. You might be able to fool your friends. You might be able to fool your parents. You might even be clever enough to fool your spouse. You can wear this public mask, but God knows who you are on the inside, and He knows what's going on in my heart. Just as God told Samuel, don't look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I've rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord, he looks at the heart. And you remember in 1 Samuel 16, it was the little guy in the room who had the big heart. It was the little guy in the room who had the heart that God was looking for. And as David grew up, he said to his son Solomon, he said, As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father. Here's what you need to know about this God that I've been trying to serve my whole life. Serve Him with a whole heart and a willing mind, for the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thoughts. If you seek Him, He will let you find Him. But if you forsake Him, he will reject you forever. Little Solomon, you know the God that you're dealing with. You know that He can read your heart. He's concerned with who you are on the inside. 1 Kings 8, verse 39, Then hear in heaven your dwelling place, and forgive and act and render to each one according to all his ways, whose heart, God, whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. Not just David, not just Solomon, not just the Israelites, but everybody. God can read their hearts. When God looks at you, He doesn't see the suit that you're wearing. He doesn't see the pretty dress you have on. When God looks at you, He's looking past all of that nonsense and He's seeing who you really are. He sees the heart first. Now, that doesn't mean that your actions are unimportant. That doesn't mean that God is unaware. He doesn't see your actions. It doesn't mean that it's okay if our intentions are good, even if we don't do what God says and we say things like, well, you know, God knows my heart. That is foolish. More on that in just a little bit. God knows, you know, the kind of person I am and, and, and so even if I mess up, God's not going to be concerned with that. No. We don't dare say that, and we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. When the Bible says that God is concerned with our hearts, doesn't mean He isn't concerned with our actions. What I'm trying to, the, the point I'm trying to illustrate here is it means He's concerned for more than just our actions. He doesn't just want you to come to this church building on Sundays and worship, and, and worship without musical instruments. That's just not good enough. He wants your heart in it. He wants your whole heart in it. That's what God is concerned with. You know, wicked people, wicked people can do good things, right? 
Wicked people can come into this church building and they can worship God without musical instruments or whatever. But wicked people do good things now and then, but it's, it's not the action that's most important. It's what's the motivation behind it. Isn't that what 1 Corinthians 13, the first couple verses, is trying to explain to us? You can give your body over as a sacrifice. But if you don't have love, if love isn't behind that, if love isn't the motivating force that's causing that action, then you're nobody. You're nothing. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about the heart. And God can see the hearts of men. How does God examine my heart? <coughs> and you might say, well, that's just what God does. <laughs> I don't know. He just does. He can do that. You know, he's, he's, he's God. He's the Creator. He has some kind of, you know, uh, you know spiritual x-ray vision. He can see, see into your soul and He can see what's going on there. Well, I mean... Yeah, he does just do that. I don't know exactly how he does that. But there might be more to it than that. And the answer comes by understanding that God also wants us to look into our hearts. God also wants us to see what's going on on the inside. He's not the only one who has this ability. But he is teaching us to look inward and see who we are. The important thing is not that God has the ability to look into my heart. But that God is going to judge me. I'm going to be held accountable for what's going on inside. And if that's the case, if we are serving a God who's going to judge me based on what's in my heart and what kind of person I am in the inner man, then it's very important that I see what's going on in there too. God knows that. And God has provided a way of doing that. If I'm going to be evaluated based on the condition of my heart, then I need some way that I can look into it. I need some way that I can see myself as God sees me. Isaiah 55 is just one of my favorite, favorite passages in the Bible. And I'm going to talk about this probably, I don't know, once every couple weeks I'll bring this, this passage up. This is one of my favorites. But you understand the context of Isaiah. The Jews are taken into captivity. They're taken hundreds of miles away from home to a place called Babylon. Babylon, the greatest and most fierce military force on the planet, has taken Jewish people away from their home, has taken them to be uh, slaves in captivity. And what history tells us about captives in Babylon, what history tells us about slaves in Babylon, is once you become a slave of the Babylonians, you never get out. You're a slave. It's a life sentence. You better just deal with it. Make the best of the situation. But here God sends His prophet Isaiah and says, I'm going to get you out. I'm going to restore you to your land. I'm going to bring joy back to your life. I'm going to restore you back to your land. It's going to be better than it ever has been before. But the people, you see, the people were doubting God's messenger and His message. How in the world can God get us out of this prison? How can He get us out of this situation? These people are too powerful. What kind of king can He raise up to deliver us? How is He going to be uh, fix the, this horrible situation? And you know what essentially God says in Isaiah 55? Because I said so. That's, I mean, that's His defense. That's what God is saying through Isaiah. I'll tell you why you can believe that you're going to get out of captivity. It's because I said so. The Creator. The Creator said so. When God created the heavens and the earth, He didn't have to get His hands dirty. When God created the heavens and the earth, He didn't have to snap His fingers. When God created the heavens and the earth, He spoke and it was. He said, let there be light. He is a commander and creator of reality. When God gives the order, it happens. This is God's argumentation in Isaiah 55. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, and how high is that? <laughs> it's infinite. The span is infinite. As the heavens are higher than the earth, that's how high my way, that's how distant and far off my thinking and my rationale and my ability and my ways are compared to yours. 
Just because you don't, you can't think in your puny little mind how you can get out of captivity in Babylon, that doesn't mean that God the Creator can't think of a way. I say so, I make it happen. And he gives us an illustration. You know how the rain and the snow comes down? Well, that's like my word. The rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. It, 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 it makes life flourish on the planet, this, this, this uh, moisture from the air. Well, that's how my word is. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. If I say you're going to get out of Babylon, then by golly, you are going to get out of Babylon. I'm going to bring you back to Jerusalem. You're going to believe that or not? What in the world does this have to do with anything we're talking about today? The reason why this is important is that in the Bible, God has made certain promises. When God makes a promise, He keeps His promise. I know, I know, somebody's going to get to heaven because God said so. I know that about my God. And I know, because God said so, I know that the wicked are going to be punished. I know that's what the Bible said. He's proven Himself over and over. When God says something, it happens. He's proven Himself that He exalts the humble. He opposes the proud over and over again. He's proven Himself that He rewards the faithful in the righteous life. He's proven over and over that He punishes the wicked. And there's going to come a time when we're all going to have to stand before Him and answer for what is going on inside our hearts. So it's very important that I find out what's going on inside my heart. How do I look into my heart? Well... Hearts are examined by the Word of God. Hearts are examined by the Bible. It works in a very simple way. God says something. God says something. And my reaction to what I hear or what I read of what God says is going to tell me what kind of heart I have. It's as simple as that. How, how I react to the sermon on Sunday, how I react when I study my Bible at home, if I react, is going to be the evidence of the condition of my heart. That's how I can know, and that's how God can know what's in my heart. You remember when Abraham went up to offer his son Isaac on Mount Moriah, and he was just about ready to slay his son. God had given this command. It didn't make any sense in Abraham's mind, but he had faith. He knew that God could, could somehow keep His promise that He would be uh, a great nation, that all nations would be blessed through Him. But yet God is, is telling him to sacrifice his son. Well, Abraham goes and does it anyway. And just as he's ready to plunge the dagger down into his son, the angel of the Lord comes and says, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Don't lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God seeing you've not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now, there's a lot that's interesting about that verse, but one thing I know is that Abraham learned what kind of heart he had on that day, didn't he? He knew he was willing to go the distance. He was willing to sacrifice anything for God. God has said the righteous are going to heaven. God has said the wicked are going to be punished. That's what God says in the Word. A lot of people hear that. They hear people talk about it on the radio. They hear maybe you telling them that at the store or at work. And they say, that's a fairy tale. That's ridiculous. You're reading an outdated book that's fit for old women and children. I've got more important things to worry about. I've got a busy life. I don't have time for God. Well, that shows you what kind of heart that they have. It's a hard heart. It's an impenitent heart. People who refuse to listen to their Creator. You can see the evidence in their reaction. When someone hears God's promise about punishing the wicked, when someone hears God's promise about salvation through the grace of God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, by having faith in what God has already done and submits to that, and then maybe they respond first with, with interest or with curiosity or with some sort of sincere question, they're showing God. They're showing themselves what kind of heart they possess. When John the Baptist came on the scene at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, he said, repent. All you guys got to turn your lives around now because something is coming. 
The kingdom of heaven is at hand. You've got to change everything. And he goes on to talk about it in verse 12. His winnowing fork. Here's Jesus, the great judge of mankind. And He's pictured like a farmer at the threshing floor. He's got His winnowing fork in His hand, like a pitchfork. And he, He's going to clear His threshing floor and He's going to gather wheat into the barn, but the chaff He will burn with unquenchable fire. You've got two kinds of people in this world. Those who will listen to God and those who refuse to listen to God. He could know what kind of person. John could know what kind of person, what kind of heart of his audience by measuring their reaction to this radical message of repentance. How are they going to respond? Are they going to stick around? Are they going to listen to him and say, John, tell us more about this kingdom? He tells them what kind of heart they have. Are they going to say, John, you're a fool. Get out of here. Just stay out in the wilderness. Don't come into Jerusalem. Crazy, you know, eating locusts out there or whatever he's doing. That, that tells you what kind of heart that these people have is judged based on their reaction to God's Word. This is exactly what the parable of the sower is saying. I mean, essentially, you boil the parable of the sower down to it and you've got one kind of person who's going to keep the Word, who's going to receive it in humility and keep it with perseverance, and then you've got other people who fall away and who refuse to listen to it. My reaction, my reception of God's Word, it's going to be expressed by actions. Remember how we said actions are not unimportant? This is what we mean. Because actions are the evidence of what's going on inside. If you want to know the condition of your heart, you ask yourself two questions. Number one, what is my attitude towards God's Word? This is uncomfortable, but I want you to ask yourself that question. How do you feel about the Bible? How do you feel about getting up at 8 o'clock on a Sunday? Getting in the shower? Getting the kids ready and being here by 9 o'clock? How do you feel about that? Struggle. If you've got kids, that's a struggle. If you're elderly, that's hard to do. Get, get your clothes on, get ready to go. You've got a million things to do. What, do. what do you think about the Bible sitting on your coffee table at home? Is it, is it something that you read you know, you know, once or twice a week and, and you just kind of... Just kind of forget all about it. Oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. You know, I don't really need to know all of it. I just kind of need to know some of it. And I can take some of it seriously and other parts, you know, really don't apply to me. God knows your heart now. And all you do is have to ask yourself this question. Well, how do I feel about God's Word? Do I, am I really excited about it? Am I sincerely excited? Do I want to know more about it? Be honest with yourself. Is that how you look at God's Word? If it is... If you just look at it like, well, it's just something I do. I read it once in a while, or maybe I don't read it at all. Well, then that's showing you right now that your heart needs to be changed. It's crooked. It's, it's perverted in a way. And God wants you to know that. God wants you to know that not just to make you feel uncomfortable, make you feel bad about yourself. That's not why God wants you to know that. God wants you to change it. And the answer to that is also this. It's the Word. He wants you to see that about yourself. He wants you to change it. The only way I can see myself as God sees me is to examine it by the same microscope as God. It's God's Word. What's my attitude towards God? What is my response to God's Word? You remember the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus and they said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. You made that rule. God didn't. Jesus goes on to say to them, are you really concerned about food? Is that really the main thing here? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. This defiles a person. It's important because it comes from the part of you that God is most concerned with. Your heart. Out of this heart. Proverbs 4, 23. Out of this heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. So you ask the question, you know, why is this world so corrupt? Why do people hurt each other? Why do they break your window and steal your phone? Why do they murder each other? Why do they lie to one another? Why do they say hurtful things to one another? It's because their heart is corrupt. 
If you want to know what kind of heart you have, look at the life you're living. Look at the choices that you're making. If it isn't being informed and being changed and transformed by this Word, then something is wrong. Because a heart that God wants, it doesn't produce the things that we see in verse 19. Evil thoughts, murder, adultery, these kinds of things. And so what is God looking for? What kind of qualities does God value in a heart? Well, if we can just summarize this, what God wants in your heart is love. That's what God wants. If we would just boil it down to one word, what God wants is a heart that loves Him. We can see this in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. The law says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. That's what God wants. When, when the Jewish uh, scribes and, and, and elders and chief priests came to Jesus and asked Him, you know, what is the greatest commandment thinking they can trap Jesus? He goes on to quote this. Love, your, love the Lord your God with, with everything that you've got and the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's the first part of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. I believe in the Greek you would do no harm to the Greek text when, you, when he's enumerating the fruit of the Spirit. The first one is love peace, joy, patience, you would do no harm to the text by putting love and a colon next to it. Love is all these things. All of these things summed up, it's love. That's what God wants. It's the last thing that we add to our faith in 1 Peter, or 2 Peter chapter 1. It's love. Love is not merely, though, an emotion. Love is not merely a feeling. Do you know you can love God with your heart, but you can also love God with your might with your mind, with your soul. That's what God wants. One of the greatest tragedies of our culture is our misunderstanding of love. We, we've reduced love to, to only something that can be felt. That's all that love is. We fall into love. We fall out of love. That is such a disservice. That's such a disservice. We've limited the most powerful word in our language to a, a, a mere feeling, a mere emotion, a passing emotion. But when the Bible is talking about love, it's describing things like dedication, loyalty, allegiance, commitment, faithfulness, devotion, passion, intensity. And when you give everything you've got, that's the kind of love that God wants. That's the quality of the heart that God wants to see more than any other. So that Christ, Paul says, may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love. Everything springs forth from this root of love in the plant that is the Christian. And the more I allow Jesus to dwell in my heart through this word, the more dedicated and committed and loyal and sacrificial and humble and passionate I'm going to be towards Him. Now, I want you to ask yourself, you know, is, is this what God sees in your heart? Does He see that kind of commitment in you? Because that's what God is pleased with. Remember David speaking to Solomon. This is the God that we're dealing with. You serve Him with your whole heart. Solomon didn't do that. He worshipped other gods. <coughs> serve Him with your whole heart. I want to end with the story of the Exodus. There were... 600,000 men. That's what uh, Exodus 12 and verse 37 says. There were 600,000 men on foot, but this is not counting women and children. So 600,000 men above the age of 20 walked out of Egypt and were saved uh, from Egyptian bondage by the, uh, the God of Israel. But that's not counting women and children. In most cases, when you look at statisticians, that demographic, 20 plus men, men that are you know, 20 years old and older, that makes up about a quarter of the population. How good's your math? You take 600,000 people, you multiply that times four, and you get 2.4 million people. David, am I right? Okay, good. <laughs> you get 2.4 million people. 2.4 million people. I mean, a roundabout. Out of that 2.4 million people that left Egypt, do you know how many 
came into the promised land? Two. Why? Why? Two people entered the promised land. Now, of course, they had children and those children grew up. All of those other people were lost. An entire generation of Israel was lost in the wilderness. Why? Psalm 95 says, For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah. Look back at Israel when they hardened their hearts at Meribah. As on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test, God says, and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work for 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Two can you guess the text I've been preaching from this morning? The Word of God is living, is active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God is judging my heart today. And God is judging your heart today based on the reaction that you have and I have of this Word. Over two million people died in the wilderness, not because they built their tabernacle to the wrong specifications. Over two million people died in the wilderness because their hearts were not completely devoted to God. I want you to examine your heart today at Danville. I want you to see what's going on inside. How do you feel about God's Word? Are you still continuing in rebellion when you know something that you're doing is wrong? God wants you to change that. And we want to encourage you to change that. As I'm, as I'm trying to change that as a preacher, I'm, I'm reading this Word and I'm seeing how my life doesn't match up. And it's a, a daily thing. Repentance is not once and done, brethren. It is a lifestyle of repentance. I am ever turning to my Lord. And if I can encourage you to turn to the Lord as well today. Just, just let me know. Maybe you want to be baptized into Christ. Maybe you've heard that command over and over and over again. Let me tell you something. If you've heard that command, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, and you simply have not been baptized, you know the kind of heart that you have. But maybe you're willing to submit to that command today. God wants you to. He's begging you to. Come forward as we stand and sing. And do that right now. God is...